Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be looking at the Stations of the Cross. That's right. Today we're joined by Jordan Watwood from Ave Rosary, and we're going to explore the Via Crucis. We're going to look at all the different stations and some historical facts and some spiritual facts behind them. When you consider the devotional life of the Church, meditating on the mystery of Christ's love for us, there's no greater devotion than the Stations of the Cross. What a fitting time to go through our first Stations of the Cross episode during Lent. For sure. Yeah, yeah I'm excited about it. Good to have you here, Jordan. Great to be here. Always good to have you here. You've been on a show before, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. My wife and I did one on adoption. That's and right. And we've done a, a couple little spots for Ave Rosary in the past. So That's yeah, right. Great. Good to be back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so the Stations of the Cross is one of the, the great devotions in the church, you know, um, really putting yourself into the passion of our Lord and exploring spiritually and even through the movements of the body, the different stations of what Christ experienced on his way to Calvary is one of the most important meditations that we could do, especially during Lent on Fridays. Now, you could do it year-round, any day of the week, but Lent on Fridays, it becomes a very special devotion to prepare yourself for the Triduum and the Passion. And we're going to talk about that today, go through each of the stations and reflect on them so we can really understand more deeply Christ's passion. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have prayed the stations in their local parish, and almost every single local parish in the world has Stations of the Cross on Friday, and we certainly have it here. It's well attended, and, you know, sometimes it's accompanied by a good fish fry, too, like the Knights of Columbus putting them on. (laughs) But, you know, the, the Stations of the Cross provide us a glimpse into the heart and the passion of Jesus and his love for us. And there are many devotions that that have been written by saints. You know, St. Alphonsus Liguori, for example, has a very, very powerful Stations of the Cross. But this goes way back to, you know, basically the 18th century uh, of in practice. Well, even further than that. So there is kind of a, you know, a circuitous via, hmm, pun, mm-hmm. that really leads to what we know as the Stations of the Cross today. It wasn't always the same wasn't always in the same order, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I think for people listening, you know, we have a lot of non-Catholics listening or some people who might not even be familiar with the stations. So the Station of the Cross, there's 14 individual stations, okay? And what a station is, is a small reflection or to commemorate a particular instance along the Via Crucis, right? So there's 14 of them that kind of chart the path Christ took from being condemned to death to being laid in the tomb. And there's 14 of them. And we're going to go over that today a little bit. But before we do that, um, Jordan, again, welcome. You've now, I think this is probably a fourth or fifth appearance. He's one of our yeah. most recurring <laughs> guests that we've had. Hey, uh, we always love having you well, on. Good to be here. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so Jordan's from Ave Rosary. They make beautiful rosaries. They make handmade rosaries. Do. They have a really cool thing that they do that anytime you buy a rosary, they donate a rosary to the CFRs in New York who distribute them to the poor, the needy, uh, people who are suffering from addiction. So it's a really great kind of way to, number one, find a heirloom quality rosary, right? So many times you buy rosaries and they're, you know, cheap $5 plastic ones, but they make rosaries really befitting of the prayers of the contemplation of the rosary. But then you're also helping someone else experience that. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and Jordan has some really cool uh, things available to help you in your devotion to um, the Station of the Cross. So we'll talk Mm -hmm. about that. Now, let's get into the history. Now, you said it goes back to the 18th century, but in actuality, it goes all the way back to the patroness, patron saint of archaeologists, which is St. Helena. Helena. Mm -hmm. Uh, And her being commissioned by her son, the Emperor Constantine, to go to Jerusalem and find these holy spots. So a lot of these were identified all the way back in the 4th century, Mm -hmm. and tradition goes all the way back then. Um, but they, they developed over time, right? So yeah, as it, as it relates. And when I, when I mentioned the 18th century, it's more in relationship to how it's been developed to the way we practice it. That's right. That's exactly right. But the devotion to the cross, there's no greater saint that has devotion to the cross than St. Helena. That's right. I mean, it's, I've been there where the aqueduct was and, and where they, where they did a lot of excavation Mm -hmm. 
And when you're there in the Holy Sepulchre, to go downstairs into that region that, that where the cross was found is one of the most powerful places. And one of the greatest places, too, where you actually do the Via Crucis, the way of the cross, is in Jerusalem leading up to that place. Which yeah, so cool. Really cool. That was a really, really, uh, it was very interesting. You know, it's not what most people would think, right? You know, you're doing the stations in a church. It's a solemn environment. Well, you're actually like in a really busy alleyway mm -hmm. in a very bustling mm -hmm. village, you know, and you're going through and you're focusing and you're praying and, wow. and people are staring did at you. Did you and Jen kind of, do that together? We did. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, we did that on our on our uh, 10th anniversary pilgrimage. That we oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that you know, really cool. I think something that's interesting is, well, how long, you know, so the Via Crucis goes through Jerusalem, the old city in Jerus Jerusalem, and really yeah. covers the exact path Jesus would have carried his cross to Calvary. It's about two thousand feet. It's about a third of a mile. It's, it's not, not as terribly far long. As I thought. Yeah, it's the same experience that I had too. I it, was it, like, it, oh I always thought it was like a really long journey, but yeah. it's not. Yeah, it's not. I think it's the way that we meditate about mm -hmm. it, the way we were we're kind of taught, and that we we you know we kind of meditate as American Catholics in the way that we pray, and then you go there and you're like, this is completely different than what I thought. Mm -hmm. it's still beautiful, but. You know, my wife was like smacking me, saying, "Hey, what are you trying to say? You didn't suffer enough? Like it's not a long, you know, like not, not long. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that." The the distance, what I found was interesting, was where his captivity was, where Jesus was was imprisoned, and then from that location to Pontius Pilate was a greater distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the Gethsemane, mm -hmm. which I, I found to be the most beautiful place there. Mm -hmm. Gethsemane was just mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the architecture of the old city of Jerusalem, I mean, this is not a modern metroplex. This is not New York. This is not Chicago. I mean, these are small, tight, walled cities mm -hmm. where people are living very close together. So, and when, they're all trying to sell you something. Well, <laughs> but true, but which know, is okay. I mean, it's you know, it's a little village. But during the Roman <laughs> occupation, all the administrative buildings and all those things would have been very close together. Mm -hmm. So that's why it really isn't as long as you'd imagine. He's not carrying this cross three miles. It's yeah. You know, it would be like going from, you know, 5th Street to 7th, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're going from the jailhouse to the courthouse, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's that kind of thing. So I think that's important to give context. Now, I'd like to see any of us get whipped, yeah. starved, oh, yeah. Yeah. abused, yeah, and then carry a cross yeah. that far. I mean, I yeah. probably couldn't do it now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with the Via Crucis and where it starts. And that is the first station is Jesus is condemned to death. And that happened at the Antonia Fortress or in the Praetorium mm -hmm. where Pontius Pilate, you know, has that trial, right? We know this from scripture, you know, he brings him before the people, he finds him guilty. Um, and an interesting thing is, and Jordan, you, you and I were talking about this, is that the Praetorium was a Roman garrison mm -hmm. essentially. And that's where Pontius Pilate would have been ruling from. But the way of the cross starts with him being condemned to death, but he had to get up to Pontius Pilate and there was in this building, and it's still there, but there is a set of 28 stairs called the Scala Sancta. Mm -hmm. And you've actually been on those. Yeah, yeah. My wife and I went to Rome for our honeymoon. So just remembering back almost 15 years now. But um, I remember it was just in this kind of unassuming building um, right next to the cathedral of, uh, I believe, St. John, John Lateran. Lateran. Yeah. 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 And then they, the steps were covered in, in this old wood all the mm -hmm. way up to protect them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like... And you had to walk up them on your knees, and and it was just amazing how to come out of the bustling city of Rome into this space that's so quiet and prayerful, and there's just different pilgrims on their knees in different places on the steps making their way up there. And they're, the grooves and the indentations from just, you know, how many years people have been so doing this, it was insane. And then you get to the very top, and, I, and there was this room up there that was just shut off from everybody. And if I remember correctly, it was like the Holy of Holies, right? Mm -hmm. And you could look in, but you couldn't go in. And it was just, that was an incredible experience. The, the whole being in Rome was amazing, but that was just like being transported to a whole nother place. That's right. Time. Yeah, so crazy. they brought these stairs from Jerusalem to Rome, and that was part of Helena's... Yeah. Yeah. Doing. Because, you know, at that time, it had been 300 years or so since the crucifixion. And yeah. a lot of these old <coughs> uh, Roman buildings are starting to decay, starting to break down. And 
but it's very easy. The locals would have known by traditional, well, that's the Praetorium. Mm-hmm. This is this and so and so's house. Mm-hmm. And and thank God that she did move she, these yeah. relics because yeah. it, it for the preservation of some of the most sacred things in the life of Christ yeah. and and the apostles. You know, thank God for it. You yeah. Know? But that I I agree, Jordan. My goodness, that experience yeah. of and it's different than. Any of the churches, the principal churches, the basilicas of Rome, yeah. you go in there and you're going to, there's a lot of people, it's a lot yeah. of noise. It wasn't a touristy thing. Yeah, because no. Because everybody there was there in prayer, mm-hmm. which is very mm-hmm. different, you're right. And, and yeah. you feel it, it's like everybody's silence, you brought me right back to that experience. Mm-hmm. Everybody's silence and penance as they're cl- they're mm-hmm. climbing up on their knees it's like this immersive experience in solemnity mm-hmm. and prayer and and to realize in this place for so many years people have been doing this to suffer mm-hmm. in, in penance it hurts. in communion with Christ. It does. It's not a comfortable experience. You yeah. know, I don't have great knees. It, it hurt on the way mm-hmm. up. And I mean, you know, nothing in comparison to what Christ went through, but it does make you think about that. Which what is was great. some of like the recollective experiences that you were having along yeah. the way as you were climbing? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the, the constant thought of, of the, the, the pain and the discomfort in the knees, you know, like you can't get that out of your mind as you're, as you're walking, you know, crawling up those stairs. And so that naturally made me think of just what Christ went through mm-hmm. during this whole experience mm-hmm. and what he must have been going through and what he did for us. Mm-hmm. So th- I remember that being a very powerful thing. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and, experience. and it's interesting that the really the beginning of the Via Crucis is in Rome, but the building, the Praetorium, the Antonio Fortress is still there. Now, yeah. The Station of the Cross used to go backwards. You mm-hmm. know, pilgrims, you would start at the Holy Sepulchre, and then they would leave there, do the devotions, and they would walk backwards right. to the Antonio Fortress. Hmm. Um, but now, you know, it, it came, it changed kind of more from, a, you know, you would always want to go right to the Holy Sepulchre when you were a pilgrim mm-hmm. in the Middle Ages, but now it becomes more of an anticipatory, almost like a, like a mini Lent, right, where you're building up in the theodrama to get to... Uh, the Holy Sepulchre. It, it's I didn't realize that that it was done in reverse yeah. uh, until this the show notes that I, I read before the before the show. Yeah. Um, but interestingly enough, I in Chestahova, shout out Our Lady of Chestahova over Ryan's shoulders back there, <laughs> and um, but at a very pivotal moment in my journey of discernment. Um, I was there in Chestahova, and they have one of the coolest stations of the cross around the church. And I went backwards and I started from the crucifixion and went and meditated on each station Mm -hmm. all the way up to the point of the condemnation um, of Pontius Pilate. And, And then that's when I realized that I needed to go off to India and spend some time uh, like in a little sabbatical in, in working in the, in the streets of Mumbai for, Mm -hmm. For a while, but uh, yeah, very. That's very interesting that it, that you would do it backwards. So mm-hmm. how long? How long did that take place? Where that's the practice? Well, for really for the first, well, I mean, the Station of the Cross were initially in the most rudimentary form mm-hmm. established in the fourth mm-hmm. century, right? But that would have been about a thousand years that yeah. that's the way people did it. Wow. Much longer than we've done it in the the current that's method. That's incredible. There was a, there was I was doing some research. There's a guy named uh, William Way, an Englishman, who they never even called it stations until he coined the phrase. Mm-hmm. And this was in like the 15th, 16th century, mm-hmm. and that's when the the format was reversed to what we do now, wow. moving through the stations towards the end. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Now, so that's the first station. Second station is Jesus is forced to carry his cross, right? And I think reflecting on that, you know, there's so many, you know, there's times in scripture, Christ is like, if you're worthy of following me, pick up your cross and come after me, you know, but being forced to carry your cross after the trauma he's been through, after the um, unjust condemnation, after the mocking in the streets and everything, um, it's such an indignity, but we, and we talked about this in the episode that we did on the science of the crucifixion. But the cross was not light, okay? Now, there was a uh, 19th century French like, scientist and a doctor, uh, Charles Verhalt de Fleury. And he did essentially an a, uh, inventory of all the pieces of the, of the true cross. Then he also compared it to other you know, relics, other um, historical archaeological finds. Also did kind of some mathematical measurements on what 
it would take to be able to bear the weight of a full grown man. I think they estimated Jesus weighed about 140, 150 yeah. pounds. Mm -hmm. And they kind of came up, this, this doctor came up with a, a weight that the cross would have weighed about between 165 to 220 pounds. Mm -hmm. Now that's all, that's depending on if the cross beam was attached, then it would have been 220. If it wasn't attached, then it'd been 165. Imagine, now we said, that, oh, 2,000 feet. That's not a lot, right? But imagine, you know, dragging that behind you after having mm -hmm. carried that. Mm -hmm. After having been tortured. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't even like this was the beginning. This was after he endured so much, you know. And, and all of the <clears throat> denials, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, like, John Paul II's ministry really kind of brings you back to the experiences of the denials as it relates to the Stations of the Cross. And then the, in the forms of abandonment, like the heart's experience, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you get punched in the gut emotionally, it's like you don't have a lot of energy sure. for things. Um, and then, you know, you're sitting there, you're being starved, you haven't had anything to eat, you've been imprisoned, and, and that isolation that Jesus suffered, um, where everybody that surrounded him uh, is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And... The, if, I know for me, whenever whenever I'm abandoned by a, or in a relationship with a friend or something like that, oh yeah, it, it takes a while for me to kind of recover from that to to do yeah. anything with energy. Well, I mean, even that's, and your, that's the premise. Yeah, even in your priesthood, you know, you've had some some dealings where you know you felt betrayed, uh, rightfully so. And I haven't seen you, you know, Father Hanky, so upset. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, so it, I always carry one with me, man. I'm ready. High, I'm ready for it to enter in with Italian, Jesus. You know, it's like, no, it's supposed true. to be my family. Huh? Yeah, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always talk to you when I get betrayed, Ryan. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, and, and it's like we, I'm I'm blessed because I I do yeah. have you guys in my life that I have friends that I could turn to. Yeah, but the fact that he he didn't have anybody yeah. to turn to shows the extent of his love and again yeah. going into the passion of Christ mm -hmm. that he would be so willing to enter into that extent so that no matter where we go what we experience in this world Jesus has gone before us yeah, yeah. I sometimes I look at it like we, we are we are his, the the pride and joy if you will of the father and mm -hmm. and the son and like sometimes I look at it and it's like we we are we are being we're, we're being tortured by the devil we're, mm -hmm. we're there the the enemy that we face is not the enemy of of you and me and and the people that are doing the enemy is is the the great liar the, mm -hmm. and and god could have handled this in many different ways because he's powerful mm -hmm. right and I mean, he created satan right so i mean this is like the the chicken and the the egg here mm -hmm. and so you look at it and you go well if you wanted to save us there's so many other ways to do that but you actually chose to come into our nature mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. take and s allow him and, and subject yourself to the the deepest yes. forms of torture, the yes. deepest forms of denial and mm -hmm. and you know so like that that just in and of itself this mystical God that we have that is is mm -hmm. become incarnate like that's mm -hmm. just fasc mm -hmm. fascinating to me that he would do that mm -hmm. right and and the sense of you know the precision of God's action and time in the incarnation. That he would take onto himself the sins of the world, right. the iniquities, mm. you know, that that he would experience it. He's entering into the fallen world, mm -hmm. you know, and and now look at the strength that he provides us. Where would we be without the crucifixion of right. Jesus Christ? Where would we be without this sense of injustice in our own experiences yeah. in this fallen world? And you think about the weight of the cross, as Ryan was saying. You know, there's the physical weight of the cross. And and for a guy that only weighed a hundred, I mean, you've seen the the pop culture pictures of like bodybuilder Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like he wasn't a bodybuilder <laughs> Jesus. He was he was a pretty slim guy. He had to have been, mm -hmm. or a small guy to be 140 pounds or so. There was the weight of that physical mm -hmm. weight, but then there was the spiritual weight of all the sins that he was carrying mm -hmm. on his back mm -hmm. too, and that was crushing. It had to be. I, I think too, just you know, how cruel uh, form of punishment to make you carry the instrument of your own death to the place of your death. It's like digging your own grave, right? Like that is just That's brutal. Yeah. Dark, yeah. yeah. Um, I've never thought about that before. That's powerful. Yeah. Mm. 
You know, Jordan, real quick, I want you to take out this because I think we can use this to follow along. And this is this is kind of a new product from Abe Rosary. Wait, hold on. Wait, let's let's look for the great reveal. Watch this. This is like my Mary Poppins carpet bag, right? Like it just keeps on coming. Yeah, I was looking at this last night. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Right. It's so cool. So what Jordan's holding right now, it looks like a rosary, but it's a devotional for the Stations of the Cross. You know, so if you're doing your St. Alphonsus Liguori or St. Francis of Assisi meditation, this will help you pray along with it. Or if, you know, you're not in a church on a Friday and mm-hmm. you can't go around the stations, this this is really nice. It's but got it a Roman numeral on the back of the station. And yeah, depictions each of each of the stations. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a description, right? No, it's just the numbers just the of the numbers. stations. The numbers of the yep. stations. Mm-hmm. And then three so beads. What a great way yep. to learn the, st- the stations, mm-hmm. too. That's the three right. beads for the three prayers. Yeah, yeah. Songs. So so if you if you look at the start of the of the chaplet with the crucifix, there's five beads. And uh, we can just go through it real quick. Yeah. So the, the first bead, you pray the uh, Apostles' Creed. Second bead, you pray the Act of Contrition. Mm. Then you do an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be. Then you meditate on the prayer of Christ crucified, and then you start to work your way through the different stations, right? There's meditations for each station, obviously, Mm -hmm. and then in between each of those meditations, there's the three beads where you pray in our Father, Hail Mary, and glory be. Okay. I, I love I love the this crucifix. I've never seen something like this. It's the nails. Mm-hmm. The nails make up the cross, and then the crown of thorns encircles the crucifix, and then the corpus of Christ. Uh, you know the the tortures. Yeah. Of of Christ. Very much designed to be reminiscent of the Passion. Mm-hmm. The, the we chose a, a red jasper bead mm. um, to be reminiscent of, of like the blood of Christ throughout the uh, the whole station. So and you have these available on Abbey Rose. We do. Yeah, we mm-hmm. have them. They're all handmade. Um, made in our shop in Athens, Georgia, and uh, yeah, beautiful. they're beautiful. And I, yeah, and I want to say something because last night he was showing us some rosaries that he was making out of petrified wood and just the beauty and the mm-hmm. the. How, the, how solid it is, but listening to you talk about these rosaries and how you've crafted them to me is very exciting because I've always just bought a rosary mm-hmm. and, but I've never like heard about how somebody's crafting something and prayerfully considering what goes into it. And, and I think that's, that's the difference. I think of Ave Rosary, why we, sure. we love having you on mm-hmm. is because yeah. you really appreciate this craft. It's something that you love doing and you do it so well that when you actually are holding it, you're thinking about, man, this was this was all prayerfully considered, and yeah. it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it was made with devotion, and <laughs> yeah. you know, like these intro after the introductory prayers, the medal where you're reflecting on the crucifixion, um, the holy face, is the holy face. Yeah. yeah, and I know you have a devotion oh, to the holy yeah. face. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a Stations of the Cross chaplet. So I've never either. We, you know, we were just talking, and I saw Beautiful this. I'm like, work. this is amazing. I want people to see about this. Now, so let's use this to go through the rest cool. of yeah. the stations. So we, we went through Jesus is condemned to death at the Antonio Praetorium. Then Jesus is forced to carry his cross. And we talked about how he was already physically, emotionally tortured. So naturally, and you would expect this, but the third station is that Jesus falls for the first time. Um, and that's so humble and humiliating and real that even God made man in his divine plan for the salvation of humankind forced to carry his cross, just like all of us have had failings and sufferings, falls, can't even bear the weight of it. If Christ can't bear the weight of the cross, you shouldn't feel so bad when you mess up, but the important, you know, but he gets back up. But him falling, I know. I think of the, um, you know, in the Passion of the Christ, the movie, um, just how it falls on him and how, uh, you know, the weight of it crushing mm-hmm. him and the indignity. And then, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot easier to get onto the floor than it is to get off the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, so the third station, there's a little chapel there. Uh, it was built by. Um, it's a Polish Catholic church, right? Polish soldiers built a little chapel there. It's, uh, you know, along the way, but that's the site where Jesus fell for the first time. There's, you know, there's a sculpture there of, yep. of uh, where Christ found a little chapel. Um, 
so that's that's the third station, you know. I mean, how many times have you fallen in your life and have to get back up? It's, it's weekly. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's weekly, and and that's why I, I try to go to confession. You know, even before the shoot, like to to go to confession, and whether it's weekly or every other week, you know, to realize our limitations, our weaknesses, our failures is really a product of of Lent, but it should be consistently practiced in our day to day life. You know, a good practice is the examine at the end of the day and, and you, you pray an act of contrition um, because recognizing our sins, we realize our utter dependency on Christ to motivate us to continue to move forward, to continue to get up. But it's also the, it's also the hinge of the relationship that you have with Christ too, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like, it, it has to be, mm-hmm. right? That's why he came. Mm-hmm. So it's like his whole purpose, you're voiding him of his purpose by not praying for the grace to see the poverty that true. you have inside that he can make rich, right? Mm-hmm. Like the richness of, of Christ. You know, Very true. And if Jesus calls us to carry our cross, he also expects, uh, expects us to fall while carrying that because he himself fell. And I think there is, there, there is the physical demand that you fall, right? Just because it was a physical impossibility for him to go on at that point. But I also think that there is a theological purpose that he allowed that to happen, Mm -hmm. because if he's going to call us to carry our cross, he knows we're going to fall, and Christ is like us in all things, Mm -hmm. and is an example of how we are to live in all things. So if he was to fall, you're going to fall. Mm -hmm. But to get back up and to go towards your, you know, ultimate death and doing the will of the Father, I think is a really important lesson that we can learn from that third station. I had a friend in in high school and college... uh, who took the idea of carrying the cross literally and would bring a cross with him to the campus to college. <laughs> this was, this was a, a public college, not a Catholic college. And he would carry the cross everywhere he went. And he would get a lot of weird looks. He'd get a lot of thumbs ups and high fives from some people. But he did that for a long time, and he would he would bring it into to class, and he would put it, and it wasn't 165 to 220 pounds. It was right. a it was a much thinner cross, but mm-hmm. he would bring it everywhere he went. It was the symbolism. And like the it. cool thing is, is now he is a uh, he's Father Malachi uh, with the CFRs. Oh, really? Oh. Super awesome guy. <laughs> there was yeah. a guy who used to maybe every six months we'd see him walking through our city with a cross. Mm-hmm. And what he was doing is he was like walking across, carrying the cross across the country. Did he have wheels on the bottom? Uh, yeah, I remember that guy. guy. Yeah, yeah, he used to come through our city, and yeah. it must have been like the route, you know, going through, sure. you know, 90 from, you know, to Chicago or whatever. But he would come through our city carrying the cross. This guy would carry the cross across the country. That's craziness. That's, That's awesome. That's amazing. All right, so now we're on to the fourth station. And the fourth station is very poignant. Uh, the fourth station is Jesus meets his suffering mother. And, you know, how the pain she felt, the pain Jesus felt, that, that's a, it's a really emotional station. It's mm-hmm. the pain here, you know, a lot of the other stations, the pain is physical. The pain is endurance. But here, the pain is deeply emotional, deeply spiritual, and deeply traumatic, so much so that this fourth station, there's a church there. It's called Our Lady of the Spasm. And now the spasm is not like in the sense that we would think today, but the spasm being that the grief she suffered was so much that she was convulsing and in tremors Mm -hmm. from the the, the grief of seeing her son, you know, that she, you know, that she gave birth to and, you know, and the angel told her, you know, salvation. And then she's seeing her son killed and Mm -hmm. yeah, that's terrible. So St. John Paul II, in his letter to the youth of the world in 2004, expressed about Mary that she steadfastly contemplated the face of Christ. And this form of contemplation, if Mary is the model of all Christians and, and she upholds what our deepest capacity is, in that contemplative state, she's always meditating, always contemplating the face of Christ. And in this encounter where Jesus meets his mother along the Via Crucis, this form of contemplation is just is just such an important moment on the journey of Christ expressing his passion because in this encounter I love I love Mel Gibson's passion of the uh, of the Christ and it's one of the most emotional moments in the Via Crucis and you see Mary contemplating the face of Christ and how Mel Gibson included that reference from Revelation 
behold, I make all things new, meditating on, <sighs> on what Christ is doing. That part just it gives me chills. It's just, it's striking. Because, you know, he, you know, Jesus sees his mother suffering over him and he's bloodied and he's fallen and he's been crucified and mocked. And he's like, behold, I make all things new. That's like, you know, we all have kids besides, you know, father celibate over here. <laughs> but like whenever your kids are sick, you know, you feel so bad and you look at them and they're like, I feel okay, daddy. I'm okay. And you're just yeah. like, oh, you know, they don't. You feel so bad. Yeah. Now imagine that times, you know, an infinite amount, Mary seeing this and then him saying, you know, I be, behold, I make all things new. You're just like, oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing the intimacy that she had as a human being, right, uh, who was without sin and, you know, seeing and contemplating Jesus throughout his childhood and into his public ministry, just her presence there and always contemplating that. Like, and then this is almost like the fulfillment, like this is it. This is this is, you know, I make all things new. It's like, okay, this is the pivotal mm -hmm. point where this is all going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like just that road and that journey that she was on, losing him in the temple, like, you know. The prophecy Anna, of Simeon. Prophecy of Simeon, her, um, what what is it, her uh, cousin having John. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, like all these things mm -hmm. in her life that were so mm -hmm. enriched and, but also, the things that she contemplated, like throughout this, this was sort of the the culmination of all that. Mm -hmm. I think that, like so many things in the the Catholic faith, we can thank Mary, you know, the Blessed Mother, for the Stations of the Cross in a lot of ways, because like, I think it's according to tradition that she she after Jesus's death, she would go back and meditate on the Stations. Essentially, she was the first one she to go the do the Via Crucis. Go do it. That's right. Mm. So wow, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, she actually did it while he was dying mm -hmm. to right but that she but would she walk, turned it into a meditation, a meditation yeah. yeah exactly wow. you know that she would walk that path again mm -hmm. remembering so now the fifth station the fifth station is that simon of cyrene helps jesus carry his cross simon of cyrene is a very very interesting character mm -hmm. and it's it's curious it's not saint simon of cyrene it's Simon of Cyrene. Now, there might be some traditions in the East where he's a saint, but in the Catholic tradition in the West, he is not canonized. Mm -hmm. That's a really curious thing to me, but it's also really, it's a very unique historical fact that the Gospels recount. Now, Cyrene was a city in North Africa. Uh, I think it's in modern Tunisia or, you know, Libya. So si Simon was obviously a pilgrim. He was a, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and he then all of a sudden gets pulled into this execution. Like, imagine when we go to Fatima this year, right? We're going on a pilgrimage to Fatima. Imagine we're just walking on the street, we're getting, you know, something to eat, and all of a sudden the cops come up and be like, come on, yo, let's go. You're going to go strap this guy into the electric chair with me. You're like, what is going on? You freak out, right? Yeah. That's what happened to Simon of Cyrene. That's, it, it's a really interesting thing, but then that Simon helped Christ carry his cross, the human you know contribution to the mm -hmm. to the passion so it's a really interesting thing to reflect on i think too like you mentioned he's not a saint um you know and tell me if this is taking it too far but i think that like canonized saints are few and far between right most of us are not going to be canonized saints um is there a way to think of this where it's almost like you know jesus calls even ordinary people and invites them to come help you know, like, I mean, God's God. Like, he did, he, he could have done whatever he wanted to carry that cross, right? But he allowed for just an ordinary person who didn't even become a canonized saint to come help him carry that burden. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously it, it, it assisted our Lord during this, this way of the cross, but think about what it did for Simon of Cyrene. Like, mm -hmm. you cannot be the same person after that. St. John Paul II expressed... If the sons of Simon of Cyrene were known to the first Christian community, it can be presumed that Simon too, while carrying the cross, came to believe in Christ from being forced. So, you know, you're being forced into this situation. He freely accepted, as though deeply touched by the words, whoever does not carry his cross with me is not worthy of me, to what you're sharing, Jordan. By his carrying of the cross, Simon was brought to the knowledge of the gospel of the cross. Oh. Since then, this gospel has spoken to many countless Cyrenians. And, and again, it's like ordinary people 
are are brought into this mystery. And that goes into the Dismas thing too, which mm-hmm. we did a show on that, yeah. which was absolutely powerful. Love Saint Dismas. If you want to go watch a good Catholic talk show, but uh, <laughs> no, um, yeah, but like the encounter of yeah this, and this is why we're talking about this is because we can still encounter Christ through the Stations of the Cross. That's mm-hmm. why this rosary or what I don't even know what chaplet you call it, chaplet. Yeah. Yeah, it's so powerful because that's that's what we're doing here. But not just Simon of Cyrene, but Veronica. Exactly. And that's actually the next station is Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. And when, you, when you're kind of progressing along this meditation to realize his encounter with the Blessed Mother, then immediately his encounter with Simon, and now an encounter with Veronica. Yeah, it shows that he was not, this is not a solo play there's other people there's humanity involved in the passion and And that should invite us to jordan's Mm -hmm. point it should invite us in to seeing how we participate right yeah now meeting veronica and her wiping the face of jesus number one i think it really shows the compassion of this woman just seeing this person you know that was a probably pretty dangerous act for someone to do Right to go up and give comfort to someone that the Romans were executing was a bold move, but this woman in her compassion could not help to do that. Now I think it's interesting. Veronica's name is probably a later addition, right? She, it probably wasn't her actual name. Was Veronica's because Veronica it comes from the Greek and the Latin, Veron and uh, icon, right? Mm. The true icon, the true image, mm. because she uh, wiped yeah. his face. That's where the name comes from, true icon. And the cloth is known as the sudarium, which in Latin means a sweat cloth, right? Um, but that she wiped the face, and tradition holds that Christ's face was left on that cloth. Mm-hmm. And it, tradition says it's still in the Vatican. You can go see it. You know, it's a small little piece of cloth, kind of brown stained, Hmm. uh, but you can kind of make out the face there. And a lot of miracles in the early church were attributed to this. Uh, They said it passed around between the early Christians because that was one of the, you know, Veronica had this with her. You know, this is something that even in scripture, we can say, here's a relic that was known to be among the believers. Really interesting, but that it's the true icon, I think, is an interesting part of this. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our patrons actually gave us a beautiful image of Veronica's veil. So a big shout out to him. But take a look at this. It's got a wax seal on it. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And, and when, you, when you have this tradition, because the, the veil, Veronica's veil, is, is that in, the, in, the, in St. Peter's? St. Peter's, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I remember that. Um, but when you pray with this image and you just see like these the the tears from his eyes and the blood and the gashes where he was struck on his head and but you see this kind of serenity in his in his facial expression as well that he had peace in the midst of his suffering because he knew he was redeeming the world um you know there's just so much here and there's so much devotion to the holy face of Jesus over the years, and and it really comes from this yeah. this uh, station. So if you, if you're doing this station in Jerusalem, this station is located in a chapel called the Chapel of the Holy Face, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously from this devotion, but tradition says that that was Veronica's house. So Veronica would have just been in her house, you know, making lunch or doing whatever, and she hears this commotion. She comes outside and she sees people lined up and this prisoner coming down the street to be executed, and she just walks out of her house. Imagine you're, you know, having lunch, you step outside, and there's this happening. And the, the cloth she had might have been very well that she was just, like, doing house chores or whatever and had this cloth yeah. on her, mm-hmm. walks outside of her house, sees this person and has compassion and wipes his face. So there's a little chapel still there, and that's where this station is uh, meditated on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is more of, like, an icon, right? This isn't, like, the actual veil... Well, what's interesting on the la- the Latin on the bottom there actually refers to the veil. Okay. And it's wow. and it's a wax seal, mm-hmm. you know, from the from the Vatican. That's amazing. So a big shout out to our patrons. I mean, we really it, the family that we have with people that have journeyed with us at the Catholic Talk Show, um, and the support that we receive really helps us to 
What do, you, what do you got going on here? Well, our patrons help us be able to afford. Our patrons are very much our own Veronicas because I do the show with two very greasy Italians, right? <laughs> and one of the things that we have to do before we record is we use these oil wipes, <laughs> right? And what we have to do is, you know, take the shine off. So we're able to afford. Della Cross will demonstrate here. We're I'm able, the greasiest <laughs> of them all. So we're able to afford these oil wipes and do our show. So in every, in a very real sense, our patrons are our own Veronicas, <laughs> helping us to wipe our faces, right? So if you want to become a patron and help us to look, you know, not so shiny. Less greasy Italian. You can go to CatholicTalkShow.com <laughs> forward slash Patreon. We have a lot of really great tiers on there. A lot of cool things where you get like uh, hoodies, coffee cups. We also, me and Ryan, every week we do a Wednesday hangout. And almost every week, but yeah, yeah, we do a hangout, and we had last last week we had like twenty or thirty people. On yeah, there. and we that go in there. A lot of fun. We answer questions with people. They talk about the episodes. We let them. Yeah. They help give us ideas for new episodes. So yeah. we yeah. had a little debate yesterday or uh, last week that yeah. was very fruitful. Yeah. yeah. So CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash Patreon. And you can go there and support us and keep us looking uh, fresh. Yeah, and before we go any further, make sure that you're hitting that subscribe button. So if you haven't jammed your finger on that subscribe button, just boom. Boom. Exactly. Subscribe. That's That's right. That's how you do it. So the seventh station of the cross is Jesus falling for the second time. Now, what I think is interesting about this, two things. Obviously, again, he's falling again. It shows how Mm -hmm. the physical... Uh, exhaustion's really setting in. But that station is located at what's called the Gate of Judgment in Jerusalem. And that's the same gate where Jesus came in on the donkey triumphantly, Mm -hmm. where they proclaimed him the King of the Jews. So he comes in through the Gate of Judgment as the King of the Jews, the Messiah, the Savior. And then just a couple days later, he's there on the ground in absolute physical exhaustion, unable to carry his cross. And that turn of events is so powerful to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you when you uh, look to Christ embracing the cross, he's also embracing humanity's weakness, and he's making it strong. My grace is sufficient, you know, and, and Christ's power and his strength is manifested in our human weakness. And he, he shows, once again, this second fall now, it's, it's crescendoing toward a complete mm-hmm. off. And what, what is the greatest weakness is death. But, but ultimately, this is a progression and a crescendo of, of that offering and entering more deeply into humanity's uh, greatest weaknesses. Yeah. Um, so the next station, again, you're seeing the interaction between the people. It's the eighth station. And that's where Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. And I think that's really, um, this comes from the Gospel of Luke. Would you, why do you read that passage, what Jesus says? Because these women are obviously there wailing and weeping, Mm -hmm. trying to console him. But instead, Jesus is consoling these women. And he does it this way. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? He said a lot of words and a lot of pain there. Mm -hmm. It's probably an important message. Yeah. And so it's it's one of the few things he said on the Via Crucis, and do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves, you know? And that shows, again, just our participation, you know, as Christians in suffering, in the passion, and that we are going to be called to that same kind of suffering if we really want to follow after him. So what John is Paul it? II's commentary, listen to this. Yeah. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? For our generation, which has left a millennium behind, rather than weep for Christ crucified, it is now the time for us to recognize the time of our visitation. Already the dawn of the resurrection is shining forth. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. To each of us, Christ addressed these words of the book of Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne 
as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And it's it, it calls us to that sense of recollecting where we are. Again, going back to, you know, we don't we don't weep for Christ. We've got to we have to repent mm -hmm. and weep, you know, and realize what our generation has to do in response. This is the time of our of the visitation. Mm -hmm. Now, the ninth station is Jesus falls for the third and the final time. And uh, this is the last station that happens outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is the last one that's happening in the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, the rest would have happened in the streets, but today when you're doing the Via Crucis, this is the last one that happens outside in the streets. Um, and this is, you said you've been there, but this is on top of an ancient cistern. This is right outside of the Holy Sepulchre, but there's a cistine below named mm -hmm. after St. Helena mm -hmm. right there. Oh, it's and it's one of the greatest places to sing. To sing. Oh my goodness. The acoustics in there when you chant is amazing. I was down there singing a radiant light. I mean, it was just it was an awesome experience. Wow. I was pulling up all sorts of hymns and That's and cool. singing them. Yeah. I was by myself too. Nobody was down there. Because not a lot of people go into that yeah. into, into it. You sing a lot though by yourself. <laughs> I mean, you treat your bathroom, dude, we hear it every morning, and it sounds like you're in the cistern, cistern of St. Helena, and you're just like, oh, swallow me, oh, it's, it's, yeah, you're, you're like a songbird. <laughs> you know, Father Rich, you talked about uh, a crescendo towards the, mm -hmm. the crucifixion, mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously the number three comes up a lot in mm -hmm. our faith, you know, and with this being the third and the final fall, um, one of the things that I, I think about is just how as Jesus got closer and closer to that inevitable moment, you know, he's weaker and weaker. The physical uh, struggle that he was going through was becoming greater and greater with each step, but I'm sure the emotional mm -hmm. struggle was becoming more and more powerful mm -hmm. too. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that third and final fall was more from that emotional weight or even mm -hmm. that spiritual weight of mm -hmm. carrying all those sins. You've got the time that it took him to walk to think about all that, mm -hmm. you know, and you can't be feeling better and better about it as you get closer and closer. You got to be feeling no, worse and worse. That's so. That's so true. And how, how isn't it true when we're rejected, or or somebody, uh, you know, basically ridicules us or, or tears us down? That that weight on our head it starts with a thought, but then it just continues to grow heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. Mm -hmm. To, to realize it that way, that, that the depth of his grief and, and being abandoned and being completely rejected, you know, that, that's just horrible. Yeah. We already see physical manifestations in the Garden of Gethsemane when he cr cried tears of blood, mm -hmm. which is a, a phenomenon that mm -hmm. can occur under a lot of stress. stress. Yeah, yeah, sweating blood. Yeah, it's like you're so stressed that the capillaries explode yeah. and the capillaries in, in your skin will intermingle with your sweat glands. And it, it's yeah. a real thing. It's a real medical condition, yep. but it's so rare. But I, you know, Jesus knowing what was going to happen to him and like Jordan, like you said, that's becoming, you know, that's facing your own execution. <clears throat> yeah. So if you think that, you know, Jesus doesn't understand anxiety. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, that's a good point. I mean, I'm pretty sure he went through some pretty serious anxiety there. Mm -hmm. All right, now, the 10th station is that Jesus is stripped of his clothes. And this is, this is a big indignity, right? You know, Jesus was likely crucified either completely naked or only with, you know, the, the loin girding. Uh, chances are he was completely naked. That's typically what would have happened, which is really? you... you the sense of a person being naked, you immediately want to cover yourself up, just like Adam and Eve. You, you feel naked, you want to cover yourself up, but your hands aren't able to do that. The, 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 the natural impulse to cover yourself but not being able to adds such an indignity to it, you know, that mm -hmm. it's, te it's terrible. Now, Jesus was stripped of his clothes there. And the Roman soldiers saw that his tunic was a really pretty nice one. It didn't have any seams. It was woven from one cloth. And that's mentioned in scripture. And they played dice for it. The Romans are like, well, we're not going to get rid of this. This is nice, you know, because textiles were you know expensive back then. So they played dice for it. And um, one of the soldiers won it because they didn't want to tear it in half because you know, to use it as fabric right. because it was seamless. That 
robe still exists in Trier, Germany, which is where, before Constantine became emperor, lived for a while. And St. Helena found the holy robe, the seamless garment, and gave it to a monastery in Trier, and it's still there. They still bring it out. And uh, you can see that, and I'll put a picture up on the screen, but uh, you can see is you know, it's a pretty modest garment, but even back then it would have been expensive. And this fulfills the... Um, you know, scripture that Isaiah, right? yeah, that they'll cast lots. You know, mm. so what does the church teach about the the crucifixion and him being naked? Because I know that uh, Adam and Eve were naked, and and the garden, and and they ate from the tree of 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 was it life? The knowledge of good, and knowledge evil. of good and evil, and then and then Jesus is hung on a tree in humiliation uh, without clothes. And so this humiliation that Adam and Eve experienced, which caused them to cover up, is now mm -hmm. naked with shame. Right. To like naked without shame. Mm -hmm. Right. They, even though the world is trying to shame him. Yeah, he, he takes that on and renews that mm -hmm. too as well. I mean, I don't know if the church says anything about that, but I was we were talking about how he was probably naked on the crucif on you know, we, we kind of miss maybe some of that. I don't know if anybody teaches anything about that in the church, but there's there's a lot to be said for just the cross itself, the, the how God intersects with humanity, how God redeems humanity for coming into it, this cross section literally of heaven and earth, of salvation and eternal damnation. <laughs> like it's all there. Just the just the the idea that there is a cross there, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there's a tree, you know, and it's just amazing mm -hmm. to think about. Now, the 11th station is that Jesus is nailed to the cross. And there's a lot of devotion to the nails. And on this chaplet, Jordan, mm -hmm. you know, your the, the crucifix is made up of those nails. Mm -hmm. um, there's debate whether there was three nails or four nails, right? Whether his feet were nailed together or they were done on the sides. Um, the belief that there's three is actually known as triclavism, which I think is just an interesting word. Are right? you a triclaviate? I think I probably would be a triclavinist. You know, I would think that there'd be you three instead of four. Pig. Oh, you're a you're a, quarto, you're a quarto clavinist. You're dead to me. <laughs> um, but the the nails of the crucifixion were a very important relic and a sign of authority in the Middle Ages. And it was said that Constantine's crown actually had the nails put into his crown. Um, and a lot of the, the kings of the Middle Ages would say, you know, we have one of the nails or a piece of the nail. Mm -hmm. uh, one piece of the nail is in, um, in the Vatican. The Holy Lance of the, the German Imperial Regalia has a part of it. Um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell which is which, is which at this point. Um, but if you've ever stepped on a Lego, you know how bad that hurts, hurts. right? Now imagine a large iron nail nailing you to a cross. Yeah the pain would explode. Mm -hmm. And where they would nail Jesus, we talked about this in the science yeah. of the epi of the crucifixion, it goes through one of the most painful points, right across a nerve, and that nail is rubbing on that nerve. And if you even move, the nerve explodes with pain. And it's not like, you know, getting punctured or getting even stabbed. It's a constant stimulation of a nerve that causes the most incredible pain that I don't think any one of us could actually even imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a tent stake. I was thinking about the tent that we were mm -hmm. helping Kim with. Mm -hmm. like, the it's, church. Like a, it's almost like one of those. Mm -hmm. And when you think about your feet too, like it's connected to your whole your whole body. So, you know, that the excruciating pain all over his body as it re, as it relates to the foot. And then, you know, his body being whipped and up against the mm -hmm. up against a, a very rough surface right. of a cross and you know like the the excruciating pain of that i mean like how he didn't pass out you know from from that pain is just incredible yeah. and the energy that he had to muster up any amount of forgiveness for people that are doing this to him because we were talking about how much weight mm -hmm. energy and now pain yeah, and, and to and to, pu like, and to push up and to hold himself up so that he could breathe. To even say that. To even say words from the cross. I don't think anyone can really comprehend what that felt like physically. 
in in the sense of of what's happening here in the excruciating pain of the the body of Christ and what he's enduring, the strength of God is revealed, mm-hmm. and and the strength of Jesus Christ, and that and that strength is still with the church, right? We we draw on that strength, we follow after that strength and that witness. So, you know, how we look at our own personal suffering is measured to this. But what you're saying, Sheil, is absolutely right. Like, who can actually enter into the depths of understanding and knowledge as it relates to Jesus' suffering, mm-hmm. one, but also Jesus' strength? Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and that's why this meditation on the Station of the Cross is so enriching, is that this is the closest we can get. God willing that we don't experience the same, but a lot of saints have to really trying to get into the depth of what that felt like. And you mm-hmm. use the word well, excruciating a- that comes from the Latin excrucis, cru- yeah, uh, excrucis, mm-hmm. which means from the cross. Mm-hmm. And that, that means, you know, that the pain is excruciating. It's, it's particularly descriptive of the crucifixion. So from Jesus being nailed on the cross to now Jesus dying on the cross, and we know the, the words that were exchanged, the, the, the power he had to lift himself to be able to express these words, leading us to the point where he breathes his last. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and we hear about that in John 19. Um, why don't you read that for us? And this is, I think, there's really not much more that we can say about this than what is said here. Mm-hmm. Jesus, therefore, when he had taken the vinegar, said, it is consummated, and bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. He you know, gave up his spirit. Yeah, yeah and, and I like this translation that it is consummated. Sometimes you'll yeah, see... this is Dewey Rames. Yeah, you'll see it, it is finished, right? But it is consummated. It really has that sense of this is now the true marriage of Christ yes. to his church. This is the consummation. And, this, and is the, this is the spiritual marital act of making this yes. m- mystic wedding actually happen. This is the consummation, mm. and that's powerful. And to Fulton Sheen's point, is like what's happening on the cross is seminals. You know, the insemination of the bride and new life mm-hmm. in, within the church. And, and I do. I, I join you in that feeling specifically on, on that word, consummated, yeah. consummated, the literal translation, you know, and, and how it ties to that, to that marital union mm-hmm. that we enjoy perfectly in heaven with Christ. Yeah. Consummatum est. Mm-hmm. Um, very, yeah. I, like I said, I don't think there's a lot that we can say on that one besides when you're praying this, you know, really meditate on that 12th station because that's... That's the consummation of the stations of the cross, but there's still more. So mm-hmm. you know, to because there's things that happen afterwards. So the thirteenth station is Jesus. And, and typically at, at the twelfth station, though, there's there's a moment where you're like kneeling yeah. and you exercise silence. Yeah, and that's yeah, which is exactly. like chilling in the church. Mm-hmm. It yeah, is that's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And when I when I reflect on the twenty years or so of doing Stations of the Cross each year, that that's what stands out the most mm-hmm. is is that moment of yeah. silence. Yeah, and in Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Calvary was a rocky outcropping. Mm-hmm. It was kind of like a mound, um, and the church is built up over that. You know, it doesn't have the same topography anymore. But that capstone where the cross was inside is still exposed. You can see that rock of Calvary where the cross was you know, uh, wedged into, so it would stand up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, so if you're in Jerusalem, contemplate right there, that's where that happened. Mm-hmm. Now the 13th station is that Jesus is taken down from the cross. Now we know in scripture that, you know, the, the, the land went into darkness, right? And all the Romans are freaking out. They're like, Oh, you know, the big, the wind blows and the temple veil rips in half and things are going haywire. And they're like, we got to get out of here. So what they would do during a crucifixion to make it speed along to make the person who was dying on the cross die quicker was to break their legs because then they couldn't push themselves up to breathe so that they would then suffocate very quickly. And scripture specifically mentions, (coughs) excuse me, that the Romans went up to break Jesus' legs, but they saw he was already dead. They lanced him. Blood and water came out to show that he was dead. So they didn't break his legs. Now they broke the legs of the of the two thieves crucified besides him. But this also goes back to a prophecy, right? And there's two interesting things. So if you, Psalm 34 says, none of my bones will be broken, right? But also the Paschal lamb, the Passover lamb in the Jewish Passover meal 
One of the things in Mosaic law was that none of the bones of that lamb could be broken mm-hmm. for it to be eaten. Mm-hmm. And you see here, again, you see that, um, that, that Passover allegory happening here that none of the bones of the sacrificial lamb were broken. And I think that's a really interesting thing uh, to contemplate. Also, you know, the wound, the blood in the water, you know, the, we see that in the mass, we see that in St. Thomas. I mean, a lot of, I guess, um, tributaries come off of this particular um, mention here. So Jesus being taken down from the cross is then laid into the arms of Mary. And this has been, you know, celebrated throughout art uh, and and statuary for years. And how many Pieta. people, exactly, how many people go into the Vatican exclusively just to see Michael? Remember Lott? how big it oh, was? Oh, my man. gosh, it's crazy. It is. And, and it's, so, it's so striking and moving because you're, you're beginning. The scriptures don't touch on how Mary felt, mm-hmm. right? But artists and and even from apostol- the apostolic college, people revered Mary's suffering, and in that in that statue of the Pietà of Michelangelo, you see Mary's face, and I think that's what's so striking that as she's holding the the dead body of her son, you know, the dead body of God incarnate, you know. She's there, and it's like that expression in the mystery of what's happening is just so so in, inviting mm-hmm. to to spend a lot of time with. And it's certainly in the Vatican, I mean, it's just people are there for yeah. a very long time. Mm-hmm. All right, so so that brings us to the final station, and that's Jesus is being laid in the sepulcher. And um, Scripture tells us that. Typically, when someone was crucified, they would take the body and then do further indignities to it, either leave it up there for months at a time as a warning to other revolutionaries or criminals. They would sometimes throw it in in the body in Gehenna, a garbage dump, um, leave it for the animals as an indignity. But Scripture tells us that Joseph of Arimathea and the other apostles went to Pilate, and Joseph of Arimathea was described as very rich. And I think he kind of like he pulled a personal favor from Pilate to be able to take possession mm-hmm. of the body, um, which is an important thing because Joseph of Mary, Mary Mathea was rich. And typically at the time, people were buried in communal graves. The Jewish burial practices of the time is that there would be niches, right? And the body would be laid in there. And then one year after the death, they'd go in and collect the bones, put it in an ossuary, and you'd have a bunch of little you know, cubbies on the wall with different boxes of bones, right? But Scripture mentions that Joseph of Arimathea, being rich, was able to have a brand new hewn rock um, sepulcher that had never been used. And that, I think that's really an important little um, detail that the gospel share with us that, again, it was so close, you know, because this is right, you know, on the outside of the walls of Old Jerusalem, and that's where the Holy Sepulcher is. To this day, that rock hewn tomb is, is still there, and that is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But thinking of Joseph of Arimathea getting the favor from Pilate, bringing the body there, providing the tomb, that's why he's the patron saint of undertakers, mm-hmm. you know, and, and burial preparation, grave diggers mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But you guys have both been to that spot, right, Ryan? You've been in the, yeah. in the Holy Sepulchre. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't get to go all the way in, but uh, there was a mass there that was being said for, I think, a Byzantine ride or something mm-hmm. like that, but... It's a powerful place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's the preparation stone, which is where his body was laid, prepared with the spices, washed and cleaned by the women, wrapped in the shroud, according to Jewish custom. And then there was the actual inner chamber, which is where his body was laid for mm-hmm. the three mm-hmm. days. And that's in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, inside the edicle, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and that stone that you're describing, too, where his body would have been prepared, they, they spread a fragrant uh, oil over that. Did you did you notice that? Did you get to see that right when you walk in? And and I took I'm my I'm kind scarf. of embarrassed, you know, I, I didn't get to go in. So what happened? Why, well, did you, why didn't you I, We got up at like four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And uh, and then when we went, there was this big mass there. And then so there were a lot of buddies trying a lot to go people. in there. And then and then after they were done with mass, we're thinking we're going in and this other group comes in. And then it's just like, do we stay here and go to mass with them? And then somebody was telling me about this ladder over here on the wall. I kind of got distracted <laughs> about this ladder. 
it's some ladder that's been there for a hundred years and yeah. nobody's gonna move it because mm-hmm. somebody's mad at somebody else. So so I, I got distracted. Thank uh, God you were not the medieval pilgrims getting the records because they're like, Yeah, we went to Jerusalem and but there's this <laughs> ladder there, you know. The no, pilgrim we, of Bordeaux. <laughs> yeah, we went everywhere else. Like yeah. it was you know, but I mean, you know, it was yeah, I mean they're everywhere else. Yeah, you know. It was really cool. I, I was in the chapel, you know, where you have the reserve of the Blessed Sacrament uh, in the tabernacle. It was a beautiful little room that you can pray in, and it's the quietest place in the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, and this priest came out, and um, we just started talking. And then he brought me actually back into the rectory area and, and where there's residences, and he brought me out and around and he showed me some backdoor stuff and like there's some excavations going on here and I mean it's a fascinating cool. fascinating place mm-hmm. but I took my scarf and with with that oil that fragrant oil I just like took my mm. huge and that's what they put it there for right yeah, yeah. exactly you see they bring in like linen and that's how you mm-hmm. get like relics yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so it was it was fragrant for a really really long time uh, just a very very powerful place the best place, really, to do a meditation on the Stations of the Cross, without a doubt, meditating on the Passion of Christ. Second to that, you know, for years, the Colosseum has been mm-hmm. a location in Rome where, you know, uh, the the meditations on the Stations of the Cross have taken place. And again, we just want to encourage everyone out there, especially as we're in Lent, yeah. you don't have to just do the stations on Friday. This mm-hmm. could be a daily devotion. And and what Jordan has put together here with, with this chaplet, yeah. I mean, what a great way to do it. And I've loved watching you throughout the show, Jordan, go through each through. each bead and, yeah. and uh, each mystery. I think, too, one of the things that uh, is easy to do um, as a Catholic, there are there are certain things in every church that you just get so used to that you can become blind to. Mm-hmm. And how? when is the last time you've actually looked at the stations in your church? Mm-hmm. And if it's been a while, look at them, mm-hmm. you know? Especially now they're in Lynn, it's a great time to do that. Yeah, and you may have a retreat center, too, in your diocese. Look up the diocesan webpage. Mm-hmm. We have one here in the Diocese of St. Augustine, and the Stations of the Cross out at Marywood is beautiful. It's a nature trail. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. You know, and and you know there there may be something right around the corner for you to actually go to. There's another spot in Northeast Florida, in Corona, which is in between Volusia County and Flagler County, but it's a Carmelite monastery, and you could actually drive through the Stations of the Cross or walk through the Stations of the Cross. And you know, many people travel there that know of it, but it's it's kind of off the beaten path. So make this your make this your Lenten commitment to find these different places where you could do the Stations of the Cross and enter into these mysteries. Now, some of the structures that we haven't really touched on is how each station is is begun. So we start with "We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you." Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. And then there's a scriptural reflection. There's all different types of devotions. But that typically, universally, Mm -hmm. we always reflect on that. We reflect on we're adoring Christ, our adoration, and, and we lift him up because he is most blessed. And, and we recognize that in our affirmation. And, and that is, that is the, the presider's voice, is that affirmation of adoration and blessing. And then realizing because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world, that the atoning sacrifice of Christ redeems us and brings us into the mystery so that we can participate in it. And that's the greatest fruit that could come out of this. Where do I fit in mm-hmm. to the Via Crucis? And and then there's a, a closing prayer for each. And then something that I, I, I don't want this show to go uh, to conclude without is the Stabat Mater, uh, which is, again, universally uh, held up. And it's really reflecting on the sufferings of Mary, throughout the way of the cross. And the first one, the first invocation. At the cross her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping close to Jesus to the last. And it goes That would have sounded amazing in a cistern. It, oh, mm. buddy, that cistern is the best. And so, you know, if, if you're out there, you've never done the Stations of the Cross, you know, you could do a simple Google search. Uh, one of well, my I'll favorite. put links. I'll put oh, links perfect. to like St. Alphonsus Liguori, St. Francis. Put JP2 up. JP2's in the Coliseum. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. Yeah, we drew a lot from this show from his mm-hmm. reflections on that. 
And then Jordan, why don't you tell people where they can get this chaplet? Because again, sure. I've never seen one of these. And when I when you showed me this, I'm like, dude, we got to do a show on yeah, our stations because totally. this is amazing. Yeah. So so we have these on AveRosary.com. Um, and uh, when you when you go there, you scroll down the page. You'll see a section where we have all of our handmade rosaries and chaplets, and this is the first one that's that's on. There. And I'll put a link directly to that particular okay, thing. Now, great. there's not these are all handmade, they so are. there's not a lot of this them. This is a labor of love. It takes a while to make one of these. So we have 25, um, and that that's all we're going to make for this season. Mm -hmm. um, and and maybe we'll make more for next Lent. But yeah, yeah, 25. 25. Okay. So if you want one of these, and I'm I'm positive that these will all sell out because oh, they will. Um, I'm going to buy one. Yeah. So uh, that's 24. Really... There you go. 24. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a really great devotion. I've never seen one quite like it. Really beautiful. Um, this is, yeah, the, absolutely amazing. Um, Ave Rosary, again, great website. Jordan does it. It's out of uh, Athens, Georgia. They hand make all, a lot of their rosaries. You know, they, they contribute rosaries to the poor and to the needy through that. So it's a great, um, even just an apostolate support, but you're also getting mm -hmm. heirloom quality rosaries and devotional items and chaplets. So really amazing. Um, so again, we'll put links to all these different ways to pray the stations of the cross. You know, a lot of people, as a note, will say there's a 15th station. There's not, but a lot of the stations of the cross will have a resurrection chapel at the end. So you can go reflect on the resurrection, but there's 14. Not 15. We're not, you know, doing that. Um, uh, but again, the Stations of the Cross, one of the most beautiful devotions. So if you've been doing the rosary or if maybe you do the, the Jesus prayer or, you know, you do the Angelus every day, try incorporating this at least on Fridays in Lent as a bare minimum and contemplate on the passion and uh, of our Lord. It, it's, it's so powerful and so spiritually enriching. Yeah, we just did it, mm -hmm. and it was awesome, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, to formally go through this now, I think, uh, with this show and all the notes and things that we've been talking about kind of help us to have a better experience. Mm -hmm. think, Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. we're going to conclude the show with the last verse of the Stabat Mater. While my body here decays... May my soul your goodness praise, safe in paradise with you. Amen. 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 What a great show. Jordan, yeah. always good to have you on. Thanks. And we'll see you all next week.